Warning, this game is rated M for Mature. The following review may contain blood and gore, strong language, and intense violence coming from the gameplay footage within the video. Viewer discretion is advised. My, My time, time with reviews is on the verge of return. return. It, will it will be a time, time for rebirth. rebirth. It, will it will be a time, time of resurgence. resurgence. It, will it will be a time, time of return. return. It will be, be a time, time of... Revengeance! Why, hello everyone! It's story time! Once upon a time, there was a man that read a book who would give everyone a glimpse of the world of storytelling. However, that isn't the case. This is more of a world about video games! Metal Gear Rising, Revengeance, batteries not included. Hello folks, this is your friendly neighborhood double RPG here, and I am back in full force. Now today's game is more about breaking ground with a particular franchise that I've come to know and love, as it redefined the stealth espionage action genre from the days of the MSX2 up until now. Now of course I'm not talking about the NES deformities because of them not holding up to today's standards because of their flaws, but I'm talking about that one particular franchise that was created by legendary game designer Hideo Kojima. And yes, that franchise is Metal Gear. Kojima is a guy who's amongst the most famous game designers out there, such as Shigeru Miyamoto, Hironobu Sakaguchi, Tetsuya Takahashi, Shinji Mikami, Hideki Kamiya, and many of those others who have a fiery passion for developing video games. Now, the Metal Gear franchise is set in a world that is filled with espionage, film noir, betrayal, action, love, hate, comedy, tragedy, death, and many of those other genres that you come to know and love, as it stars a guy who is pitted to saving the world countless times from a nuclear holocaust. Now, the game that we're taking a look at today manages to branch itself away from the stealth espionage action genre and becomes more of a hack and slash action game that stars that whiny protagonist that would eventually become a cyborg badass under the codename Raiden. No, not that Raiden. Or that one. But this one. Metal Gear Rising Revengeance is a third-person hack-and-slash action title developed by Kojima Productions and Platinum Games as well as it being published by Konami. You play as that cyborg rap scallion who was once a Liberian child soldier named Raiden as he works along a private military company that is renowned for increasing the peace from a threat that rivals their practices to seek world domination. Get out your trusty swords, your arsenal of projectiles, and sense of espionage all in your mind, because it is time to play ninja. Through my review of this game, of course. I think it's time for Jack to let her rip! Our story begins with Raiden appearing in an unnamed African nation recovering from a previous civil war to where the young cyborg and his team, Maverick Security, are escorting the Prime Minister named Namani through a stroll amongst the streets of the town. However, an unknown cyborg blocks the route of the tanks and limousine that the Prime Minister is on, and this mysterious man works his way to killing all of the Maverick Security soldiers while not holding back. Raiden comes out of the foray to protect Namani from the assault but is eventually captured by another cyborg soldier who brings him onto a train. Our hero makes a run for where Namani is taken, but he arrives too late to save him as he is executed by his captor named Sundowner and has a battle against the person responsible for the halt of the stroll, Jetstream Samuel Rodriguez. Raiden does everything he can to fight back, but he is outmatched by the enhancements of Sam's cyborg suit that makes the technology within Raiden's own suit very outdated. This organization that attacked Maverick Security and the Prime Minister would be known as Desperado Enterprises, and they escape while leaving a defeated Raiden bathing in his own blood. Three weeks have passed since the incident, and Raiden is equipped with a new cyborg suit with the enhancements that are on par with what Desperado cyborgs have equipped, and he tracks them through the war-torn nation of Abkhazia, the secret Guadalajara Research Facility in Mexico, the World Marshal HQ in Colorado, and to an airbase in Pakistan to get his revenge. However, playing through the story has more to it than just simple revenge over the bitter defeat at the beginning, as something big and more sinister than an act of revenge is taking place, and Raiden must put his thoughts aside as he must stop Desperado and World Marshal once and for all. 
Now, the story from the initial perspective is that it treats itself as a new series or a spin-off in the Metal Gear universe that isn't canon. However, the general consensus agreed that since this game takes place in the year 2018, that is four years after Liquid Ocelot's insurrection in Metal Gear Solid 4, and with this game starring Raiden as the main hero gives more of the impression that this game treats itself as a canon entry. It treats itself as if it's truly a part of the main lore of the Metal Gear storyline, but in a new direction with a new hero. A reboot, essentially. Take a look at RE4. While it is either loved or hated by some, it is still a reboot that treats itself like a main series entry, but in a newer direction while being faithful to the main lore. It's simple as that. Revengeance comes in as being a hack and slash, albeit there being a little bit of stealth elements to coincide with the Metal Gear brand's traditional gameplay style. You might think to say, oh, another mindless hack and slash. Great. Woo. Represent. Well, there's more to it than just mindlessly tearing your foes to shreds with melee weapons. There are a vast array of ways you can actually attack your opponent instead of mindlessly mashing buttons to get to where you are at. You run around and you can attack your enemies like you normally would. But the other features incorporated are sub-weapons like grenades, cardboard boxes, drum cans and rocket launchers, healing items like the recovery nano paste and electrolyte packs, and unique weapons that are secondary. The sub-weapons can be used as distractions or as another way to attack your enemies from short or great distances. The healing items are self-explanatory as you have a health bar and a fuel cell gauge because of the amount of electrolytes you have within it. Not to mention that they will automatically refill your gauges when either of them are fully depleted. Finally, the unique weapons such as the polearm, psi, and pincers can be utilized to stagger your foes, do faster damage, or to completely obliterate them by all means. If you need help from your comrades within Maverick Security, then they are available via the Codex system. Every Metal Gear fan wouldn't be pleased if there wasn't a Codex system in the game, but not to worry, as Revengeance has that feature in full force. Each person you talk to will have unique information to share with you that relates to the story, their character, or Raiden himself. They are pretty unique, as they can be much more lengthy than what you would normally hear in a Metal Gear game, although they can be pretty long too. As I said from before, the game has five different locations for you to go through. The fictional African nation in the prologue, Abkhazia, Mexico, Colorado in the US, and an airbase in Pakistan. The levels that you traverse through are very linear and no backtracking in most of the areas at all, unless if you are prompted to in order to combat some enemies. Speaking of fighting enemies when using your melee weapons, you have standard attacks that come from your sword and wide attacks that come from either your sword or your unique weapons depending if you have one of them equipped. Standard enemies can be easily slashed, but later foes will prove to be more of a match by being more aggressive with their strength or they will have impenetrable armor that you have to weaken in the process. They may be a breeze or may take time to take them down, but there is an easier way to take them down if you know how weak they are in defense and that ability you use to do instant damage or death is the game's unique feature in the combat, Free Blade Mode. Free Blade Mode will allow you to do a barrage of consecutive slashes that will destroy your foes or to chop off some limbs. You could do it manually with the right analog stick or press your attack buttons to go crazy automatically all you want. Don't get too overzealous with the attack if you are low on health. Why? Well, there is a reticle on the enemy that shows where their life source is. If you attack that spot with good accuracy, you can expose their self-repair units to fully restore your health and fuel cells. This technique is called Zondatsu, which translates to stab and grab, and it comes in handy when you are in a pinch. Always bear that in mind. By the way, don't get too happy with attacking your foes as you will need to defend yourself from their strikes. The best way to do this is two ways. You can use your ninja run to avoid damage, which can also be used to travel up to higher places by the way, or you can parry while facing your foe in their specific direction from where you are standing. Parrying is this game's defense, as it doesn't try to be like other hack and slash games where you can defend yourself from enemy attacks. So this game borrows a page from Soul Calibur when parrying your foes, but it's really easy. Just hit the button to do weak damage while you are facing a foe that is about to immediately hurt you, and you can block their attack or counter them in retaliation. It takes time, but parrying will be your best friend once you get used to it. Finally, there are certain segments within the stages where you have to fight a barrage of enemies in order to progress with the help of the score system to determine how well you did. This score system is a common occurrence in most of Platinum Games titles, where there are certain battles you have to fight in order to move on. The only kicker is that the score determines how fast you complete that part of the stage, how many hits you've done to your enemies in a single stride without taking any damage, how many Zondatsu kills you performed, how much BP you obtained from the battle, 
and how many kills you performed overall. Those determining factors will calculate how much BP you will obtain and what the grade of the battle is pressed at. Sometimes you can gain extra BP if you don't take any damage within those sequences, but they can be a pain to pull off determining how many enemies are on screen and how relentless they are. It's very tough, but practice makes perfect. And I forgot to mention that the other major element within the game is the mode that Raiden gets himself in when he needs a boost in power to let a rip on his enemies, Jack the Ripper mode. Once as you have this mode on, most of your foes will be lying on the floor with broken cyborg parts then ask for seconds with what gets chopped next. This game is packed with many variables in the gameplay, and they don't deter from the true experience of hacking and slashing your enemies to a T. Imagine if Zondatsus were a way to generate hype if you see a commercial for a game like this. Revengeance. It does a body good. Would that actually work? Maybe. In the past, Hideo Kojima always had a distinctive style when it came to the cinematic cutscenes within every game in the series. Those story sequences had elements of seriousness, comedy, film noir, suspense, surprise, and well-written dialogue. Revengeance continues that route, but more of the cutscenes are done in place to what you would expect from a Platinum Games title. They feel like they have that cinematic approach with Kojima and his team working on the story, but the cutscenes don't deter that much from the whole experience. Some may argue that that approach would ruin the style of a Metal Gear game, but I think it only blends in well with there being a joint venture between the two developers to give a unique presentation at an equal compromise. Since Metal Gear Solid 4 had a very gritty atmosphere within all the locales you visited in that game, Revengeance continues that tradition with the addition of more futuristic themes like the facilities held by World Marshal and colorfully serene environments like in the Colorado City in Mission R03, Mission R04 with the indoor Japanese garden, and Mission R06 with the outdoor environment that would resemble a modern western, without there being any sand or bar taverns or cyborgs of course. Since samurai flicks are the Japanese equivalent to spaghetti westerns in the west, then why not? The bottom line is that the presentation from what you would see in this game is remarkable, and probably the best that Kojima Productions has put in with their collaboration with Platinum Games. Even when using blade mode to chop down your enemies and the terrain to many different parts, the intention to detail with the particles is spot on. From the many enemies like the cyborgs, dwarf geckos, metal gear geckos, and the bosses to the protagonists, NPCs, and environmental aspects within the levels, Revengeance does justice in the delivery. That transition between cutscenes and gameplay blends in very nicely. The sound is a pleasure for Metal Gear fans out there who want something new or something old to make a grand return for their ears. Metal Gear games always had more of a full-scale orchestra within the games, but Revengeance has done the complete opposite as Jamie Christopherson handles the music in this game instead of Harry Griggs and Williams this time around. The tunes for when fighting against enemies and bosses have more of a rock and metal vibe to get the gamers pumped for some intense battles, while the infiltration sequences tend to have more of that vibe of what a Metal Gear game should sound like within the whole film noir approach. Having metal tunes for the fights may turn off some people who are familiar with Metal Gear, but I think it only gives more flavor to the whole score. I mean, since we are in a new start in a new direction for that part of the franchise, then again, as I say, why not? Next. The voice acting in the game is exactly what you would expect in a Metal Gear title. The voiceovers are of top quality and perfect fit for the roles. For instance, Quentin Flynn returns as Raiden who delivers some of the best work for the character as of yet. Metal Gear Solid 4 may have brought him in more closely to Raiden's edgy side, but Revengeance kicks that tone to the max when in Jack the Ripper mode. Albeit some parts where he plays hero and has struggles within himself when questioning his motives. Other famous voiceovers include J.B. Blanc as Boris, Phil Lamar playing Kevin Washington, Kari Walgren voicing Courtney Collins, Jim Ward playing the role of Doctor, Crispin Freeman voicing Sundowner, and the list goes on with the top talent within the dialogue. Finally, the game offers modes for you to go in. Probably two of the biggest features within the modes are the customization mode and the VR missions. Customization mode occurs during the gameplay, on the title screen, and after each mission to purchase newer weapons, items, costumes, attack moves, fuel cells, life extensions, and upgrades to your weapons. VR missions are there for you to test out your skills against some of the weakest to most difficult enemies that you will only find in this mode because of your weak default weapon and whatever else you have at your disposal. Just be prepared to go through some of these missions in multiple playthroughs because achieving first rank on all of them will prove to be quite a challenge. When starting up a new game, there are three difficulty modes to select from, with one of them where you have to unlock via playing the hard difficulty, and one where you have to punch in the famous Konami code on the title screen. Oh, what nostalgia. 
These harder difficulties will test your patience and sanity as they are some of the most frustrating modes to get past. Later enemies will appear much early, the need to parrying their attacks are coin essential to your survival, and the will to stay alive will be a bigger priority over everything else. The collection mode lets you view some of the collectibles you have obtained in this game, and some of those collectibles unlock special items and weapons, but I'll be getting to that in a short bit. All in all, the presentation within those aspects are strong, simple, and very enjoyable, and the replay value hits it high for you in wanting to come back and try to 100% everything, albeit it being very hard in the process, mind you. So you worked your way up since your first mission in Abkhazia to the last mission at the airbase in Pakistan. Now it's time to put the true conspirator to his resting place, as that senator and presidential nominee named Stephen Armstrong is the one behind the whole ordeal with him trying to bring the world to his knees to cause another all-out war on the world. Upon his muscle is a new Metal Gear under the name Excelsis, and you must fight it off before going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Senator in two segments where he is unbeatable, and one where you use Jetstream Sam's sword to do all the dirty work in stopping Armstrong in his place. This final fight against Armstrong proves to be one of the most insane and intense battles to go through, as the guy will throw out his punches to try to stop you and him trying to heal himself from total defeat. He'll unleash a barrage of melee attacks to try to knock you down, knock away the weapon that is in your hand, and punch a flurry of fire pillars to the ground to reduce your chance of getting away. Not to mention he'll occasionally throw huge chunks of debris at you to do more damage, but answering him back with free blade mode to slash the debris with precision slices will help you greatly. This guy won't stop until he sees you dead, so those keys to survival as well as some occasional quick time events that you need to get past will satisfy your grasp on victory. Upon his defeat, you slay the Senator, return home without coming back to Maverick security, and pave the way for a new battle that sets the ground for a potential sequel. The whole battle will make you feel satisfied for delivering a job well done, and it will urge you for more playthroughs than just playing a single one. What do both a Metal Gear game and a Platinum Games title have in common? They are littered with extra content! Metal Gear Rising Revengeance proves to be no exception to that standard. Throughout the main campaign, there are enemies that have left arms that are filled with insurmountable loads of data that is very beneficial to Doctor with his cybernetic research and to learn who these arms belong to. Data storage items that are used to display concept art of the characters, enemies, and mechs in the game, hostages to save when they are being held up at gunpoint, computers to unlock all 20 VR missions, men in boxes to find and slay them, and titles to give off that sense of achievement within the gameplay. Locating some of the left arms, data storage items, men in boxes, and completing some of the difficulty modes and VR missions will give you access to different costumes, swords, and unique items such as wigs to enhance the experience of blade mode and such. Locating and obtaining some of these goodies can prove to be very beneficial to the multiple playthroughs of the story. Probably the most beneficial items to use would be the Fox Blade that was included as a pre-order bonus through major gaming outlets like GameStop, as it can easily penetrate through even the toughest of armor within an enemy, the Blue Wig to give you infinite time through Blade Mode, and probably the Grey Fox Skin to make it seem like you are playing as Frank Yeager as the Cyborg Ninja from the first Metal Gear Solid. Hells yeah! Now, some of the other costumes and wigs do have their strengths and weaknesses, or they can just be there for show. For example, the custom red body will absorb electrolytes more quickly but consume fuel cell energy at a large rate, and custom blue armor depletes fuel cell energy very slowly but offers a heightened boost in defenses. The infinite wig A will give Raiden the ability to sustain unlimited ammo, and the blade mode wig can easily dismember an enemy in the mode except for bosses. Some of the blades are unique in their own rights, like the stun blade that can easily daze your enemies without problem. The armor breaker offers better chances to penetrate through an enemy if it comes down to being an alternative for those who don't have the gray fox skin and fox blade DLC. And the machete can slash her foes at impeccable speeds, as long as it goes with the mariachi suit. Arriba! If you want to be pacifistic with taking down your foes, unlock the wooden sword by locating all five men in the boxes throughout the story, and you'll be able to knock your enemies out without the need to kill. It is silly, but for an extra achievement will not make it hurt. Some of these collectibles are very fun and unique to experiment, so go with the one you feel is best suited for your taste.
Any way you look at Revengeance, it doesn't come off being a masterpiece, but it is one of the only spin-offs within the main canon that etches in so many great qualities for gamers to come back and play. The replay value, the gameplay, the music, the presentation, the voiceovers, and the extra fillers such as unlocking the goodies and completing the VR missions are enough to destroy one's appetite for content. However, just because a game is great doesn't mean it's perfect. Probably the only issues I can find within the game are the campaign's length, questionable directions within the narrative, some content being useless or OP'd, and the frustrating difficulty within the VR missions. First off, the campaign comes off being about 5-6 to six hours within a single playthrough, but I guess this is due to the fact that Platinum Games picked up to work on the game in late 2011, and thus no more time for extra content could be put in based on time constraints. Next. Some of the directions within the story such as stopping the coup d'etat, stopping the creation and mass production of child cyborg soldiers within the market on their brains and spine, and stopping the senator from achieving his quest for bringing about a bigger push for the war economy with never-ending battle. It seems like there isn't a basis for what is the internal conflict within the story, as many of these acts can prove to be a driving force to make a story about. Now to be fair, the game does have great dialogue and some spots within the narrative that are very well written but some of these conflicts coming about without there being a definitive one can bring about an identity crisis. The next thing I find very questionable are some of the weapons and items that prove to be extremely necessary or worthless in some regards. One of the things they did in the gameplay was kept the aspect of trial and error with how you make it out of a battle, which I really like about games of old and new, but certain items can both be a hindrance and a helping hand. For instance, the Foxblade is ridiculously overpowered as it can easily tear up an enemy in short time. This makes the need for trying to do Zondatsu's pointless when they are almost necessary for a battle in case you get hurt from an enemy. The Foxblade comes off being a godsend for the more difficult settings, while the easier modes can see the weapon as an insult to your skills. Even that default high frequency blade in the VR mission shouldn't be your only weapon available for use, because it is weak and it makes it more painful when trying to take down some of the more dangerous adversaries. Speaking of which, missions 17 through 19 are not balanced that well as they spent more times with a failed mission or a lower rank from the overall ordeal within each one. Most of the others are balanced out just fine, but I feel that those three specific missions will turn off so many who yearn to complete the mode. Not to mention that the stealth aspect seems to be more of an afterthought than an important factor as obtaining an S ranking within every fight and level comes off being more needed to exceed in your skills. Hence, this game doesn't call itself a stealth espionage action game, so that can be seen as nothing to spill the beans over. Other than that, nothing else really comes to mind to brag about as Revenge is a treat for MGS fans and hack and slash gurus alike. Metal Gear Rising Revenges is probably my most favorite game within the spin-offs of the Metal Gear franchise. Granted, there have been some other really good games too, such as Metal Gear Solid or Ghost Battle on the Game Boy Color, and Metal Gear Asset 2 on the PlayStation Portable. But this game delivers us something fresh and new that can set the standard of creating its own franchise with many potential sequels that can come out in due time, since this game does hint at one. But other than that, Metal Gear Rising Revengeance is considered a must-buy. episode of Double RPG Reviews. Be sure to rate and favorite this video as well as leaving your positive and negative feedback in the comments. Also be sure to hit that subscribe button up there because more support from you guys definitely means more reviews, less plays, news stories, and two cents videos are coming from yours truly. Also be sure to follow me on Facebook and Twitter as well as Twitch.tv because I will be doing live streams from now on so be sure to be on the lookout for that. Now if you'll excuse me, the next game I have to review is one that is based on this nifty little device from a new console that just came out from Nintendo not too long ago. Now the game I have envisioned is one that's based on four player side scrolling co-op action and it is a follow up to a review that I did back in 2009. If you haven't seen that review already, then be sure to check it out in the description below or just click on the annotation in this video. Now, if you'll excuse me, and for the next minute or two of this video, be sure to take a look at Raiden, who is dressed up as Great Fox, and he is doing Kenshiro's multi-punch technique on the Senator in the final battle. This is Double RPG signing off, and I'll see you on the next episode. Later, guys! Yeah. Ah.